Listen, it's 16 years. We can do better than that, right? Woo! Crazy. Do you remember when you were 16, anybody? I don't. When trauma hits, people, you block the memory. All of humanity is sold this, like, you're gonna do big things, and you're gonna do big things, and you're gonna do big things. Who's gonna do the small things, right? Who are gonna do the important things? Like, you're gonna throw the biggest party. Yeah, but who's doing the dishes, hello? Well, good morning. Man, you guys are jacked this morning, I love it. Love it, love it, the live stream, so glad you're in the house. So uh, today is gonna be a good day for me because I don't, I, I get to actually just be a part of you guys, like as in just be a person sitting and learning because I've got a friend of mine, a, a mentor of mine here in the house and before uh, I, I ask him to come up, I gotta introduce you to him in a sense because his name is Mark Demaz and he has done an amazing work um, in, in, in really shaping the future of church Churches, uh, because here's why: because this guy has been doing so much work for the last 20 to 30 years on diverse churches and multi-ethnic churches. It, the, before anybody was talking about, hey, there's a problem in the church, this guy was talking about it, and he has done so much for creating churches like Mosaic. In fact, he pastors a church called Mosaic with an X because they're 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 thug apparently, but but. <laughs> And we're creative, so that's, that he literally does, uh, he pastors the church, but he's written seven books plus, he speaks at conferences, he's kind of a big deal, okay, and he's super smart, he's super smart. The only thing I've got on him is I'm funnier, that's the only thing. <laughs> That's the only, that's the only thing. And so, hey, um, w- can you make him uh, feel at home? Can we just go crazy, make some noise for Mark Mass? Come on up, bro. All right. Hey. Hey. What's up, man? And, and, and he's related to me, too, right? Yeah, that's right. Kuwaiti. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Pakistani. <laughs> hey, I am so excited. Don't be busting on me about being funny. Now, before, they do a run-through on this thing, right? And so they had to check the mics and... And uh, they said, just say anything. And somebody goes, tell a joke. Well, I got four grandkids. So the first joke that popped up to me, uh, when I said it, I said, uh, what state is round on the ends and high in the middle? Ohio. Ohio. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah. What? Okay. I said, well, you said a joke. I said, well, how about this one? And uh, I said, uh, did you know there's only one United State, a state that's mentioned in the Bible? Did you guys know that? There's one state mentioned in the Bible. It's actually the state I'm in, state of Arkansas. Yeah, it's actually mentioned in the Bible. And Noah looked out of the ark and saw, right? So uh, it's there, constipation. Moses took two tablets, went into the wilderness, you know. Uh, uh, David served in Saul's courts, tennis, and all that. So I was on the way out, and, uh, and one guy says, he goes, you're funny. I said, I am 60 years old, and not one time in 60 years has anybody said I'm funny. So don't be telling me I'm not funny, okay? It was verified here this morning. But seriously, I am so uh, honored to be here with my good friend Naeem and Ashley and meet Kristen face-to-face and Mike and the team here. I have admired the work for many, many years. Naeem and I do a bunch of stuff around the country uh, here and there, but um, this, these are my peeps, right? This is my people, and the passion of this church hope for all the, the, the vision, all that stuff. I'm so excited to be in the space, to see it, to feel it, and to meet you all this morning. And of course, because Naeem is so strict to time, I got to get right to it. You know what I'm saying? So I, yeah. see, I am funny, right? Okay, just kidding. So, uh, but anyway, thanks for joining us online this morning as well. Super glad to have all of you here. And I want to uh, just tell, uh, I want to tell you about my journey quickly, transition a little bit. We're going to open the Word of God this morning to see, this isn't about Uh, this isn't so much about diversity as it is about discipleship. This is about discipling the American church, certainly, into the whole gospel and the whole heart and the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. We're going to find that out this morning, but how did I get into this journey? You know, Naeem mentioned uh, uh, many years uh, that I've been engaged in this work. Well, what happened was I was a youth pastor uh, for 18 years uh, prior to starting Mosaic with a C. Our network is Mosaics with an X. Uh, in 2001 in Little Rock, Arkansas. Now, I was brought to Little Rock in 1993. Uh, I'd been a youth pastor for 10 years. I was brought to an amazing church there. Uh, uh, That church, when I got there in 93, to be the youth pastor, so 7th through 12th grade uh, students, I came with 10 years of experience from the West Coast, get to Little Rock. Uh, An amazing church, as I mentioned, when I got there, there was about 2,000 folks in this church. 
Uh, over the na- next uh, eight years, that church would grow from two to 5,000 people. My youth group from 150 to 600. I started with an assistant, like an administrative assistant. I ended up with nine full-time people just for seventh through 12th grade kids. I was in the top 2% of paid youth pastors in America. I built a three and a half million dollar student center just for kids. Like, just for 7th through 12th grade students, they said, here's the money, we'll raise it, go design it with the architects. You know, three full courts, 36-foot climbing wall, a jumbotrons, an insane facility. And I got a chance to do all that. I'm living the dream. The point is, I'm living the dream in this amazing church. Until one day in 1996, 97, I looked around this incredible place, incredible people, etc., and I realized that the only people of color were janitors. And that began to bother me. But I wasn't sure in the moment why that bothered me. It just began to bother my spirit. Something's not right about this. And, uh, and of course, we're living in a town at that time, I'm going to say roughly 42% African American. And I just began to wonder about these things. Now, at that time, I had a master's degree in exegetical theology. Sounds very fancy. Just basically studying the Bible a lot. Uh, today, I have a doctorate in that. But the point is... Um, I was taught in seminary that the way to plant, grow, and develop churches was to target a specific people group and essentially give them everything they want, black, white, whatever, rich, poor, just just like marketing. And it's called the homogeneous unit principle, the same kind, homogeneous, the same kind. So you target people. If you want your church to grow fast, target a specific people group and essentially give them everything they want, and they will come in large numbers. I was taught that that was biblical. Uh, I was taught also that in the New Testament, churches were segregated, uh, meaning that Jewish believers, those who were uh, ethnically Jew, uh, raised in the religion, uh, Jewish religion, then came to Christ, became part of the way. They went to churches for just Jewish Christians, and everybody else, called Gentiles, went to Gentile church. I was taught that that was true in the Bible. But again, based on my experience, I began to wonder, is that really true? Were the churches of the New Testament segregated? by color, class, culture, as I've been taught. Is it biblical to plant, grow, and develop local churches focused on a single people group? And doing my own homework, throwing out my seminary notes, diving into the exegetical theology of the Word of God, I came to realize that every church in the New Testament outside of Jerusalem was a, what we would call today a healthy, multi-ethnic, and economically diverse church. Men and women, Jews and Gentiles, rich and poor, as we say in Little Rock, walking, working, and worshiping God together as one. And it was that unity, more than the words, it was the demonstration. It wasn't the explanation so much of the gospel that people began to respond to. It was the demonstration of the power of Jesus Christ to be lifted up and draw all people unto himself. By the way, you know what the word in Greek, Koine Greek, uh, means for all? When you read it in Greek, you know what it means? All. That's what it means. It means all. You know, you know what world means? It means world. You see what I'm saying? Hope for all. And it wasn't the explanation. It was the demonstration of diverse people willing themselves, as it is today, to walk, work, worship God together as one that declares a credible gospel to a, a lost, dying world. In our case, an increasingly diverse, painfully polarized, cynical society. Folks, they no longer believe the message we put forth collectively as an American church. We continue to say to this world, God loves all people from segregated pulpits and pews. And the message is not believable. It's unbelievable. It's not not a problem with the gospel. It's a problem with us. A problem with us. So what I did then, when I realized this, I was in that church another several years and trying to figure these things out biblically, got to a point where I left that church, stayed in Little Rock, went to the urban center of Little Rock, 30% poverty, 67% of kids without dads in the home, highest violent crime in the city, with what Christianity Today would call three years later a big dream in Little Rock. Could diverse men and women who love Jesus will themselves to get beyond what is otherwise natural, what is otherwise comfortable for the sake of becoming the church, which is what you're talking about here. Not just about me being a Christian, about us being the church. Could diverse men and women will themselves to walk, work, worship God together as one to declare a credible message beyond what we say and how we live? 
And I'm happy to tell you, in just two uh, months, we are celebrating our 20th anniversary as a church. So we're just a little bit ahead of you. You were 16 last week, we're 20. Uh, but I can't believe we're still alive, we're still on our feet, and still singing about Jesus, worshiping, walking, etc., and making an impact in the local community. So that's how I got into this journey, uh, literally about 25 years ago, what led me there. Now, I want this morning then, I want to show you that I'm not out promoting or pursuing uh, uh, this biblical vision, encouraging discipleship of the body of Christ for diverse men and women to come together to walk, work, worship God together as one. I'm not out promoting or pursuing this vision because of changing demographics. That's all well and good. Uh, in fact, you probably know this. Today, one in two people under 18 are non-white in this country. 43% of millennials are non-white. By 2042 or so, one in two people in this country will not be white. And that's all well and good, but that's not why I'm here talking about this today, right? I'm not talking about it because Barack Obama is biracial and somehow represents the changing demographics of the church, not because the late Rodney King asked us all to get along. All that's well and good. I'm here promoting and pursuing, chasing this vision as an individual, collective in my church, and I suggest you are as well, because it's biblical, it's right, and it is the only hope we have in the 21st century of advancing a credible gospel in an increasingly diverse, painfully polarized, and cynical society. It is biblical and it is right. And I want to show you uh, from the Word of God this morning, just into one passage, particularly or one book, that biblical morning. But before we get there this morning, uh, I, I want to just say this. At the end of my studies, late 1990s, before I started this church, I had been raised Catholic. I was raised Jesuit Catholic, and I was an altar boy. Catholic schools, the whole works, right? And as I was studying scripture and, and realizing that the way things are are not the way they were and not the way they're intended to be, uh, I, I remembered that prayer, the Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. And I began to ask myself this critical question. If the kingdom of heaven is not segregated, then why on earth is the church? If God taught us to pray that what's going on up there ought to be going on down here, and we know heaven's not segregated, Revelation 7, 9, every nation, tribe, people, and tongue, walking, working, worshiping God together as one, we know it's not segregated there, so why on earth are we segregated here on earth? That's the question that's been driving me now for 20 to 25 years, and again, I want to take you to the word of God on that. But I'd suggest to you, I wasn't the only one thinking about Naeem and, and Ashley and later Mike and Kristen and leaders here. That's what your church is doing. That's what you have disruptive leaders because, see, anybody can go with the flow. That's called sustaining innovation. But what you have in Ashley and Naeem, for instance, are dis what's called disruptive leaders. They don't just see what's in front of them. They see what's around the curve. You see? They don't just see what's ahead, and they open new markets, doors, and possibilities for others. This is called disruptive. In the business world, it's called being disruptive. Uh, you might think about it as swimming upstream, right? Not easy to swim upstream when the flow's going one way and you go another. Very few people can actually handle disruption. Very few disruptors, they can't handle it because they're looking for the accolades of the world. I would suggest your church is disruptive, right? And, and why I'm saying that is you have disruptive leadership, therefore you're disruptive, and you are right where God wants you. Why I'm saying that to you is in the midst of COVID, and more specifically, chasing this dream, this is not popular. When I got into this 20 years ago, only 7.5% of churches in the United States had at least 20% diversity in their attending membership. Just 7.5%. That's it right? Uh, churches are 10 times more segregated today. Churches are 10 times more segregated than the neighborhoods they're in and 20 times more segregated than nearby public schools. I'll submit to you that breaks the heart of God. And again, we're asking the question, why is the church segregated? Well, we don't know the word of God, right? And we're going to talk about that in a second. But back to Naeem, Ashley, your team here, they are pursuing a path of disruptive leadership. And you know what that means? Your church is at 3,000 people and who cares? This is why I mean, because I'm all about, big deal. You want to be 3,000, great. I'm not against large churches. If our church, if this church is large, great. But you don't need large size to have mega impact and influence in your community. Yeah. Yeah. So good. And I want you to understand this because um, a city is like a pie. So I'm just going to, let's say there's 12 slices. Well, I came from a rich, white, suburban, et cetera, et cetera, church, 
right? And I thought everybody loved us. We're 5,000 people in a town of 195,000 people. Are, we cast a big shadow. I thought we had a lot of influence until I got outside of that church. And I realized different demographic groups, number one, didn't even know we were there. And number two, if we did, they hated us. So I had, you know, after a year and a half or so, we had 100 people in our church maybe. And I started getting phone calls like from a writer, wanted to write about us in a book and Christianity Today and the mayor of the city, I want to put you on a board and somebody else. And I sat back and we had like 85 people in our church. We were around two years. We didn't have, as they say in the South, excuse me, a pot to pee in. <laughs> and I sincere, I wasn't chasing any. I'm like, what is the deal? Like, because in the large church I was in, those pastors weren't being asked to be on the board of this or Christianity Day wasn't right. And I, and I was sincerely perplexed. What is the deal? And I sat back one day, and that's why I felt like the Holy Spirit taught me that a city is like a pie. So, yes, we had 5,000 people, but they were white, Republican, suburban, upper class. You see what I'm saying? So when that, those 5,000 people got out on a Sunday morning, they largely went back into one or two slices of the pie. They live in the same neighborhoods, they work in the same industries, they ran in the same social circles, their kids went to the same private schools, they vacationed in the same spots. So yes, a lot of bodies, but in terms of influence, very limited. But we had 8,500 people back then, right? Prior to COVID, we only have 500, 500 or so people, 550 on a Sunday morning prior to COVID. But what I realized is my little 85 people were going out into eight or nine or 10 slices of the pie carrying hope for all, the message of God's love for all people, not just some people, into the barrios, into the inner city, into the suburb. And, and we had, we, we, so what I realized is when your church is a healthy, multi-ethnic church, and I'm not just talking about diversity in the pews, I'm talking about structural diversity, equity, justice. When a church is like that, I would submit to you, it's been my experience, that a church has at least 10 times its size of influence in a community for the reason I said. And by the way, size is a 20th century metric. You don't chase size in the 20th century. Disruptors, they don't chase size. You know what they chase? Influence. Yeah. And the greater your diversity, again, assuming structural health, the greater your influence will be. And that's why your church is influential. You may look at another church, oh, they have this many or whatever. But those are all 20th century metrics, my friends. Those churches are chasing 20th century metrics and hitting them. And I'm here to tell you it's the 21st. And we are 20 years into a 100-year movement because entire epochs of church history are summed up in a word. You ever think about that? When people look back into church history, they'll look back, they'll say the 16th century. They'll say, what happened in the 16th century? You know what they say? Reformation. The Protestant Reformation. In 100 years of church history, what did God do at the macro level is summed up in a single word, Reformation. Third, fourth century, Constantine, conversion of Constantine. What will be said of us in this century, 200 or 300 years from now, should the Lord tarry? What will be that word? I don't know what the word will be. It may be multi-ethnic and recall, but the point is what you're doing is that future. And we're only 20 years into a 100-year movement. My friends, you are on the cutting edge. And of course, nobody gets it. But you do, and God does, and that's what matters. So like Paul told the church at Galatia, speaking to the diverse churches in the, Galatian, uh, uh, the region of, Ga uh, of Galatia, he said this, let us not lose heart in doing good. He's not talking about Mark to Moz, don't lose heart. Sure, we can, but no, he's talking to churches like yours. Let us, collective, not lose heart in doing good because we will reap in due time if we do not quit. I want to encourage you with that word. Keep on keeping on because you are right where you should be, way ahead of the curve and defining the 21st century here in America as a church. So way to go, Mosaic, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. So with all that in mind, um, I mentioned to you that I'm not here promoting because of changing demographics, that let's talk about the Word of God at a macro level, the why. Because again, this isn't about changing demographics, political correctness, none of that. This is about the hope of the gospel and rooted in biblical theology. So 
When I began to study this in the late 90s, um, I, again, opened up the New Testament. That's where you find the church. And I realized a few things. Here's the first, that Christ himself envisioned the multi-ethnic church on the night before he died. John chapter 17 in the upper room where we get the, the Last Supper and all that. Christ prays in John 17. He's prayed for himself. He's prayed for the disciples. And then he prays for all those who would come after the disciples who believe in him through their word. Well, that's us. On the night before Jesus died, it ought to blow you away. He prayed for you, and he prayed for me. What did he pray? That we would be one. Three times in three verses that we would be one so that the world would know God's love experientially and come to faith in him. A credible gospel. Christ envisioned the church would be multi-ethnic. Now, if I'm right about that, and I am, then you'd expect to see that happen in the New Testament, right? So the second point I realize is Luke described this church in action. He gives us the model. And it's not Jerusalem, by the way. So pastors and seminarians at Bible college, we are all taught that the model church of the New Testament is Jerusalem, Acts chapter 2, 3, and 4. But it's not. It's Acts chapter 11. It's the church at Antioch. Uh, Acts 1.8 follows Matthew 28, right? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. The entire book of, uh, of Acts is the telling of the story of the advance of the church from evangelism to becoming what God wanted it to be. In other words, Acts chapter 2 in the church at Jerusalem is not a, starting, uh, uh, not a stopping point. It's the starting point. And you're not even a biblical healthy church until you're at least Acts 11, Acts 13, Acts 16. But we like to stop at Acts chapter 2. So I realized that Luke described what Christ envisioned at a church called Antioch. It was everything you are and everything we'd want to be. It was multi-ethnic, uh, economically diverse, men and women, Jews and Gentiles. First time in church history that a church determined to be multi-ethnic for the sake of the gospel. Uh, by the way, when you think about these churches in contrast, Jerusalem and Antioch, uh, which church is the first to send missionaries to the world? You ever think about that? It wasn't Jerusalem. It was Antioch. Which is the first church to take up a collection, uh, a financial collection, not for their own needs, but for the needs of others very far away? It wasn't Jerusalem. It was Antioch. Why? Because when your church reflects its community, when your church is a healthy, multi-ethnic church, mission isn't a program. It's who you are. It's who you are. And that's modeled in Acts chapter 11. The diverse leadership team, by the way, you can go to the website and look at the staff page uh, at Antioch. It's Acts 13.1. Two men are from Africa. 40% of the leadership team at the greatest church in the New Testament were from Africa. One from the Middle East, one from the Mediterranean, and one uh, from Asia Minor. A diverse staff team leading a diverse church to declare a credible gospel. Christ envisioned it on the night before he died. Luke described it in action in a place called Antioch. But what I want to spend the rest of our time looking at is the book of Ephesians. Because there, among others, I could have picked Romans this morning, Corinthians, but I'm going to pick Ephesians. Uh, because when you're reading Paul, by the way, you're reading Mosaic Charlotte. You're reading Mosaic Little Rock. This is what Paul gave his life to. Building healthy, multi-ethnic church to declare a credible gospel. Move away from systemic segregation like the Jews wanted into the health and life of the church. So we're going to look at Ephesians because there Paul prescribes the multi-ethnic church. Now when we use the word prescribed or prescription like a doctor, uh, theologians, when we use that term, it means this isn't just nice, it's necessary. It's not optional, it's biblical. So when you understand this, that's the difference between description describes what was, prescription says wherever possible, this is supposed to be. Not just nice, but necessary, not optional, but biblical. And so we'll see that here this morning in the book of Ephesians where Paul, it's like the Mount Everest. Romans and Ephesians are the Mount Everest of this message, if you will, throughout all Paul's writings. And so what I want to help you understand this morning, again, is the biblical why for this church. Biblical why of becoming Mosaic, right? And it begins uh, with understanding the book of Ephesians here. And the theme of the book is the unity of the church for the sake of the gospel. Y'all say that with me. The unity of the church for the sake of the gospel, right? Again, not about just changing demographics. We're here to be the church and advance a credible gospel. Now, if I'm right about the theme, and again, I am, right? Um, then I have to prove it to you. Right? So let me prove that the collective theme of these six chapters is the unity of the church for the sake of the gospel. 
chapter 1 all the way to chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, is Paul talking to a diverse church, by the way. Ephesus is a diverse church. You can go back into Acts 19 and, and realize its history. It's a diverse group of people, men and women, Jews, Gentiles, rich and poor, Galatians 3.28, they are sitting there, and, and the letter is being read to them, written by Paul, and he begins again, chapter 1, all the way through chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, and he's speaking to the individuals in the room. In Ephesians 1, for instance, that's where he lays out our identity in Christ. You, the individual, we have been redeemed, adopted, chosen, forgiven, uh, blessed with all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places through our faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, the first chapter through 2, 8 and 9 Paul lays out the theology that I, let me just talk about me, Mark DeMoz, I am now one with God the Father through faith in Jesus Christ. And he sums up that passage in the famous uh, verses 2, 8, and 9, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, when he says, for by grace, you, Mark DeMoz, have been saved through faith. And it's not of yourself, Mark DeMoz, right? Your good works so that you can't boast when you get to heaven, Right? Those verses that we quote so freely, for by grace you're saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, so no one can boast. That's the conclusion of that first section where Paul is speaking to the individual believer. Believer, we, we as individuals have been made one with God the Father through faith in Jesus Christ. But then there's a turning point, chapter 2, verse 10. And many people tie this verse to 2, 8, and 9. And if you look in your Bibles, because men uh, put the Bible together today, right? Chapter divisions and title headings. That wasn't in the original Greek. So most Bibles today, they'll break chapter 2, verse 10, and then they start a new section at 2, 11. But I would suggest to you the break comes after 2, 9, as I'm describing. Because beginning in 2, 10, and you can see this. Uh, take a look at the verse here. Uh, it's on the screen for you. Uh, for we, then, he says are God's handiwork. We are his workmanship, created to do good works in Christ Jesus, and we were created and prepared to do those works before the foundations of the world. You ever heard that verse? Chapter 2, for we are his workmanship. Now think about it. For you have been saved, not of yourself, it's a gift of God, individual, but we, the church. You see, it's not Mark DeMoz was prepared for good works before the foundation of the world. Is that true? I'm sure it is. God's sovereign. Okay, I get it. Is that what Paul is talking about here? No. Paul is speaking to us, the collective church. We collectively, in that context, as a multi-ethnic church, this is the work God prepared for us to walk in on this earth. Kingdom of heaven is at hand. We are his workmanship. And we collectively have been created uh, from the foundation of the world to essentially be the church. Jew and Gentile, men and women, rich and poor, walking, working, worshiping God together as one to advance that good work, that good gospel, a gospel of God's love for all people, not just some. We are his workmanship. And we collectively, the church, have been prepared uh, for good works from the foundation of the world to be essentially the church. This is the turning point. So from chapter 2, verse 10, all the way uh, through, uh, let's just say, maybe at least 4, 6, if not beyond, but 4, 6, 2, 10 to 4, 6, the second section, and he's talking about the unity of the church now, beyond the individual with God, our unity. Love God, love your neighbor. And how do you love your neighbor? Through the church in its unity and diversity, and this is the section. Now, in chapter 2, verse 10, I said, so we are his workmanship, and then he says, I'm about to explain myself. So think about that as a little thesis statement for the rest of this section. Let me explain. Now, in 2.11, the next verse, uh, uh, he goes on, and he says, it'd be like this if I can paraphrase. He says, now, let me talk to all you Gentiles for a moment. So remember, he's been talking to every individual in the church, but beginning, he makes his thesis statement, 2.10, we are his workmanship, let me explain. And then in 2.11, he says this. He says, now, let me talk to all of you in the moment who are Gentiles. Okay, you Jews, hang on. I'll be back to you in a second. Jewish believers, but let me just talk to the Gentiles. Do you know what that would feel like today if I was teaching this? I said, let me talk to you all, all of you African Americans for a moment. That's what that would feel like, okay? Because to say Gentile raised up all kinds of history and all kinds of animosity and all kinds of things from the privileged Jewish people coming out of the chosen race and all that, Jews, into the church. He says, let me talk to you uh, Gentiles for a moment. And then he says this, do you remember how you used to be labeled the uncircumcision by the Jews, by the so-called circumcision? You remember that word? 
That would be today, like, hey, let me talk to you African Americans. Remember how everyone used, called you the N-word? That's exactly how that felt. If you were in the audience that day, hearing that letter, that's how it would have felt, particularly if you're a Jew, but everyone would have felt it, because he directs his attention to a marginalized people group. And he says, remember how you were put down and you were, un you were called the uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision and they used racial epitaphs. And remember how you were distant from the promises of God? You were without hope and promise in the world. Do you remember all that, Gentiles? You can easily translate to the American context, can't you? Remember how you couldn't vote African-Americans? Remember how there was slavery Africa? You see what I'm saying? That's exactly how that would have felt. And I want you to feel that and put yourself in that context. Because then Paul says, but thanks be to God. Thanks be to God, he says. Uh, and I think we might have this on, on the screen. But he says, thanks be to God, because the blood of Jesus Christ has broke down the dividing walls that once separated us. He's talking about power, position, privilege, all those divisions, the divisions of this world that otherwise keep us divided. The blood of Jesus Christ has broke down those dividing walls. Sometimes I hear people saying, we got to break down these walls. We I'm here to tell you Jesus already did. He broke down the walls. We just have to walk through. Right? So his blood broke down these divisive walls that separated us. And in fact, if you look at uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, he says this. His purpose was to create in himself or through himself by his blood, check this out, one new humanity. His purpose was to create one new hum humanity out of the two. What's he talking about? Out of the two divided groups, Gentiles and Jews, right? Uh, today, but there's many more. So Gentiles is a whole group, right? Today we'd say blacks, whites, Asians, Hispanics. We might talk about economics and all demographics that exist in our, his, his goal, his desire through the blood of the cross, he breaks down these divisive, uh, the world's division to make us one new humanity. And he's not talking about make us one America. He's talking about make us one in the church, right? That's his purpose. And then he says, thus making peace. Peace between these groups, back then Jews and Gentiles, because there was no peace. Jews were here and everybody else was here. They were called dogs. There was all this animosity from the privileged religion. Now, Jews weren't privileged in Roman society. But in terms of spirituality, the Jews were the chosen people, so they're privileged, if you will. They have the spiritual power position, etc. So he says this. His purpose was to create in and through himself the blood of the cross one New man, one people, one humanity, thus making peace, and in one body, that's the church, in one body to reconcile both of them, Jews and Gentiles, to God through the cross, again, by which he put to death their hostility. That is the hostility between these people groups. Christ is lifted up. He draws us to be one in him. This was the purpose that in Ephesians chapter 2.10 said God purposed this from the foundation of the world. What's the purpose? To make us one in the church for the sake of the gospel on earth as it will one day be in heaven. That's his purpose. And he goes on in this passage then to talk about not just being one new humanity, but he uses other metaphors. Like, so he made us one man, one body, one temple. He concludes chapter 2 by talking about how through the blood of cross, we are now made in and through the church one new temple in which the spirit of God will be pleased to dwell. That's his purpose. Now, in chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, Paul is going to pray for them. And then in what becomes chapter 4, 5, and 6, he's going to tell the church, how do you actually do this? Right? How do we actually, how can we be one in the church for the sake of the gospel beyond the distinctions of this world that otherwise divide? That's where Paul's going. He's going to give the church instruction on how to actually be one beyond the why of it. Uh, but just like uh, Mark the Moss, Paul's prone to wander on a rabbit trail. So he does this here in chapter 3 and verse 1. And he starts and he goes, so I'm going to pray for you. I'm paraphrasing if you're following along or look it up later in the Bible. He says, so let me pray for you. But then he interrupts himself. And between chapter uh, 3, verse 2, all the way to verse 13, it's like there's a parenthetical statement. A parenthetical statement. And he digresses, and he says, now listen, I've already talked to you all about this. 
You remember I, I wrote you a letter about this, a specific letter. What he just said in short, what I just walked through in chapter two, right? He said, I wrote you, remember I wrote you a letter about this whole thing. And if you don't remember what I'm talking about here in the moment, go back and read the letter. Boy, don't you wish we had that letter. An entire letter devoted to the things that we see dimly now in Scripture. But it's clearly there. So he says, go back and read the letter if you forgot. But then he summarizes his thought. And he says this beginning in chapter uh, 3, verses 2 and 3, and into 4, all the way to 6. But he says, uh, remember I talked to you about a mystery the mystery of Christ. Now, casual readers of Scripture, and if I can just be honest, majority culture and individualism and male-dominated church for 2,000 years, when they read this passage and they see mystery of Christ, they instantly think redemption, atonement, the work of Jesus on the cross. How did God become man, etc.? That is not the mystery of Christ that Paul is talking about in Ephesians 3. He says, remember, I already wrote you about this, this great mystery that prophets long to understand, going back into history, they long to understand this mystery. But it's only been revealed to us in these latter days what this mystery is. Now, the question is, what is the mystery? I just told you what it's not. What is it? He says in verse, chapter 3, verse 6, he gives the specific mystery. And he says this, this mystery is that through the gospel, that's the redemption and atonement part, through the gospel, the Gentiles, look at, and there's going to be three things I'm pointing out here. They are heirs together with Israel, meaning the Jews. Number two, they are members together of one body. And number three, they are sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. That is the mystery of Christ. By the way, Paul uses the same terminology at the end of the book of Romans, Romans 16, and also in Colossians 1. Three times in Scripture, because wherever Paul's talking, he's talking about the stuff that today Mark the Maz talks about, Naeem, he's talking about this wherever he goes. Romans 16, Colossians 1, and here in Ephesians 3, he uses the exact terminology so we don't have to guess what he's talking about. And here what he's saying, this mystery that people long to understand, you know what it is, really? It's the church. It's the kingdom of God. Every nation, tribe, people, and tongue on earth as it is in heaven to declare a credible gospel beyond explanation in demonstration so the world would know God's love and believe. And he says, this is the mystery. And so what, what occurs? Remember, we talked about Jewish power, position, and privilege in terms of spirituality and faith. But look at these three things, right? The Gentiles are joint heirs with the Jews. So all the promises that are true for the Jews are also promises for Gentiles who believe in Jesus through faith, right? Uh, they are members together of one body. That's the church. So there's not supposed to be a black church, white church, Asian church, whatever. No, we are members together of one church. That's the way it's to be. And then also shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. So what are the promises of Christ Jesus? What are we joint heirs with? We are joint heirs with Israel in inheriting the kingdom of God someday. Eternal salvation is ours, not just Jewish believers, but Gentile believers. That's part of the mystery. We all get to go to heaven, not just some through faith in Christ. As I mentioned, we are all to be an equitable part of a local church. And number three, what is the promise of Christ Jesus if you put your faith in me, right? Salvation, the message of salvation is a promise to all people, not just some. This is the mystery that prophets long to understand that was only explained in the latter days. And essentially, we would say it's the church in all its fullness at earth as it is in heaven. Now, in 3.6, I wish I had time to take you there, but if you'll continue on, then he gets back eventually to chapter, uh, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 13, where he gets back, he closes the parentheses, and he begins to pray for them. And we see a lot. I pray that you'd know the height, the breadth, the length, the depth of God's love. He tells the church that. What's that like saying? The African-American believers, they got the height of God's love, let's say, but they don't have the depth, the length, the breadth. The white believers, maybe they got the depth of God's love, but not the, you see what I'm saying? Every people group brings something to the table. And like a prism, Paul prays that we will experience the totality of God's love in the beauty and the diversity of that. By the way, in chapter 3, verse 9, he says this, not only was the mystery delivered to me, but the administration of the mystery. How do you do it? And that's what he's going to go on to explain. And he says in verse 10, so that the manifold wisdom of God will be displayed to the world. Do you know what the word manifold means in Greek? I'm not making this up. 
it means multicolored. Look it up. He is talking about color diversity, a color as a way of an expression of diversity. This is exactly what Paul is preaching. So he prays for them, and he gets to the end of chapter 3, and then, of course, he says, Now may God do exceedingly abundantly beyond what you could ever ask or imagine. You know how many times that verse has been preached over 2,000 years out of context to raise money? If everybody just digs deep and gives, we're going to raise this money and we're going to get this building and has nothing to do with raising money and buying or paying off buildings. You know what he's talking about? What is God able to do beyond what you could ever ask or imagine? I'll tell you what it is. It's make a black man and a white man just two miles from Little Rock Central High, second stop in the American Civil Rights Movement, walk, work, worship God together as one beyond socioeconomics, everything, in a church called Mosaic in the inner city of Little Rock. That is beyond what anything you could ever imagine. And God will do it. He wants to do it, he will do it, and he will do it. You either get on the train or you don't. This is what he's talking about. So then in chapter 4, verse 1, now he's going to explain. How do you do this? He says to the church, chapter 4, verse 1, he says, therefore, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling with which you've received. These are plural used, by the way. It's not the calling Mark Damas received. It's the collective calling. Walk worthy. Well, what's the calling? To be one in the church beyond distinctions for the sake of the gospel. I hope you walk worthy of it. Let me explain. And so then he goes on in chapter, in chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, to give us the beginning of instruction, right? To give us the beginning of instruction. What is that? If this is going to work, you're going to have to be humble. Your way is a way to do things. It is not the way to do things in a multi-ethnic church. You're going to have to be patient. You're going to have to be forbearing with one another in love. Those are hard enough to live out if I go to an all-white church. Imagine a diverse church like this, right? So he begins to lean into this description, and then he says in verses 4 through 6, why? Because there's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who is over all people, working in and through all people, and uh, over all people, in all people, through all people, right? By the way, such poor translation here from so many Bibles in English. They'll say, who is over all, in all, through all. They don't even know what he's talking about. What is he talking about? He's over all the rocks and the trees and the stars. Sure, is that what he's talking about here? No, it's people. Why? Because there is one Lord faith, baptism, one God who is over all people groups, who is working in all people groups, who is working through all people groups. And then, of course, you have gifts. So he goes on in chapter 4, verses 7, uh, 7 and 11, you have varying gifts, right? Uh, some are apostles and teachers, and he talks about some gifts. And then later on, as he progresses through uh, this passage into chapter 5, he says, by the way, husbands and wives got to be one. Chapter 6, verse 1, children and parents have to be one. Uh, what am I forgetting? Uh, employers, masters and slaves in that context. Uh, today, be employers, employees. All of us who are Christians in the church, it doesn't matter the relationship in terms of employment, at home, uh, couples, husbands and wives, parents and children. Everybody's got to be going in the same direction in unity here. Why? Because if you walk into the church and you see the division and the divisiveness that exists in the world who's going to believe us? Like, I already got that. Watch MSNBC, watch CNN, watch Fox News. You see, why do I need to come to church and hear everybody fighting and yelling and not, you see what I'm saying? That's part of the reason Paul says, hey, I pray in tongues, but I don't preach in tongues. Because the outsider, that is someone without faith, they're going to walk in there and think we're crazy, right? Uh, I could go on, but I'll, I'm already uh, to time. So the point is, <laughs> he, he's, he's pointing everybody in the direction of unity. Remember I told you the theme, unity of the church for the sake of the gospel. So it's not just Jew-Gentile, if you will, not just ethnic, but it goes on to economics. It goes on to marital relationships, to children, and he gives instruction all the way through chapter 6 and verse 9. Then he gets to 10, and this is where I'll move to close. In chapter 6, uh, he says, uh, beginning in verse 12, he, he says, for our struggle, right, is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He's, he's landing in the plane. He's closing. Now, this is the passage beginning in verse 10, chapter 6, put on the armor of God. You ever heard of that passage? Everyone in America says, Mark the Maz, put on the armor of God. Naeem Fazel, put on the armor. Like, it's written to me, but it's written to we. It's written to us. And he's saying, Mosaic Church in Charlotte, Church at Ephesus, Mosaic in Little Rock, if we're going to pull this off, 
we collectively have to put on the armor of God. You see, because our struggle isn't against black and white. That's what you think it's about. Our struggle isn't about contemporary music versus old hymns. I mean, you understand what I'm saying? We reduce this struggle to all this division of the world. We bought into it no different than the world. He goes, that's not the struggle. And what is the struggle, by the way? To be one in the church for the sake of the gospel. Have I said that already? Right? That's the struggle. Like to walk worthy of the calling, we have a struggle to do that. We've got our own humanity, we've got our own flesh, we've got our own sinful nature, we've got a world pushing us apart. So he says, collectively, Mosaic Charlotte, you have to put on the armor of God. And remember this your struggle is not against the color of a man's skin or their cultural heritage. Right? Isn't that what flesh and blood is? My flesh, the color of my skin, my, the blood is kind of your culture, your heritage, right? But we reduce the struggle to that because that's not the struggle. Who's the struggle? How are we going to pull this off to be one of the church's state gospel? You've got to resist the rulers and authorities and powers of this dark world. By the way, casual readers of Scripture, they all spiritualize that. No, rulers and authorities and powers of this world. You see what I'm saying? This world, the people who own the media conglomerates, and they make money off division. You've got to resist them right? Democrats and Republicans that just, you know, every demographic group fighting to attain or maintain power, position, privilege, the way of Christ is let it go. Philippians 2. The rulers of this world, the authorities of this world, the powers of this dark world, that's who we're going to have to resist because they're all driving us apart for their own gain, for their own power, their own position, their own privilege, for their money. You see what I'm saying? You got to resist that. And how do you resist it? Put on the armor of God. And yes, there are spiritual forces and wickedness that are also against us driving. The great divider, Satan, right? The great divider. And then he goes on to explain the armament, what that involves, putting on. So we now, the church, to be the church, to resist, uh, to fight that good fight, to understand who we're fighting, who we're not, how to resist, put on the armor of God. And then he finishes all this in verses 19 through 20. And he says, now pray for me. Pray also for me that I will courageously, that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might declare it fearlessly as I should. Is he talking about declaring Jesus? I hope now all students of the word, you know he's not. He's talking about this message. See, the people of the first century, and the Jews particularly, they didn't have a problem considering maybe we got this Jesus thing wrong. You know what they had a problem with? Gentile inclusion. That was the problem. That's why Paul's beaten, he's run out of town, etc. It's not for preaching Jesus, it's for preaching Gentile inclusion. That Gentiles too can go to heaven. Gentiles too are to be an equitable part of the church. Gentiles too can be saved. That was what he's beaten on. And that's what he's saying here. Pray for me. That, that God will give me courage to keep preaching this gospel. Romans 16, he says, it's my gospel. Not a gospel that gets you saved, but the gospel of Gentile inclusion. Pray for me, because that's why I'm an ambassador of chains. You know what that means? Go back, I'll let you study it yourselves. Acts chapter 22, 21 and 22. Do you know why Paul was arrested in the temple? Am I going too long here? I, I'm, I, I gotta tell you this, I gotta tell you this. You got up out of bed, you got dressed, you want to, you see what I'm saying? You're here. Hey, I got to finish this right here because he says, I'm an ambassador of chains. I want you to know what that means. He's not saying I'm in prison in Rome. Sure, he is, but he's telling you why he's a prisoner in Rome. You know why he's a prisoner in Rome? Acts 21 and 22. They thought he brought a black guy into a white church. You hear what I'm saying? In Acts 21, when he goes where everybody said, don't go to Jerusalem, man, you're going to get destroyed, not for Jesus, but for this message. He takes Gentiles with him. And in the court of the Jews, uh, I'm sorry, in the temple, there's these courts, the court of the women, the court of the Gentiles, but there's a certain division and you can't go past that wall if you're not a Jewish man. He gets accused of bringing Gentiles like Timothy and uh, into the Jewish court. And a riot breaks out. And I wanted you to feel it. That's why I say he got accused of bringing a black guy into a white church. You see what I'm saying? That's what it would have felt like. And they threw a riot. 
and he gets dragged up on the steps to save his life. He's up there. He goes, let me talk to my people. So he gives a speech, Acts 22. You can read about it. And he tells his story, how he's converted and the whole deal. And then he gets to Acts chapter 21, uh, 22, verse 21. And he says this. He says, and then he said to me, meaning Jesus, when he got knocked off the horse in the Damascus road and all that. And then Jesus said to me, get up and go. I am sending you far away to the Gentiles. Do you know what Acts chapter 22, verse 22 says? And they, meaning the Jews, listened to him up until that statement. And then they said, rid the earth of him. He is not fit to live. This is the specific reason that Paul is arrested in the temple, not for preaching Jesus, but for preaching boldly, like you're doing here, like I'm Gentile inclusion, hope for all. And that's why he's an ambassador in chains. So with all that in mind, I'll land the plane this. Why? Why be one in the church to advance a credible gospel and a compelling witness of faith, peace, hope, and God's love for all people, not just some people, on earth as it is in heaven? How do we do that? By walking, working, and worshiping God, right? Together as one beyond the distinctions of this world that otherwise seek to divide us. And lastly, where and what do we do? We do it right here at Mosaic Charlotte. The passion of this church, the people of this church, it ain't about size, it's about influence. It's not about me, it's about us. It's not about being a Christian, it's about being the church, right? And that's where we do it, right here in Charlotte and beyond, as far as God's spirit would carry your voice and message, the people and passion of Mosaic. Man, it's been an honor to be with you and to share these thoughts as God's shared with me through the years and I've learned. And right now, I want to give you a chance, as you are familiar with here, to stand, if you would, as we move to close. I want to say a prayer for you as a church, just like Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus. Y'all stand. Let me pray for you in a second. And I know the worship team's coming back. And when I finish praying, I want to give you a chance to respond. Y'all know you have uh, candles and prayer, the symbolic of saying prayers and lighting and lifting them to God, communions here. But maybe just taking time, what, what did you learn? What did you experience? What is God saying to you? What is God saying to us? Let us not grow weary, amen? amen. Let us not grow weary because we will reap if we don't quit. So Father, I pray right now for my brothers and sisters, really a sister church, uh, just a few years apart like sisters in a house here in Charlotte and Little Rock, disruptive innovation, carrying the message of God's love, faith, peace, and hope for all, not just some, in the 21st century. Lord, I pray, God, that you will continue to give favor, you will continue to give strength, courage to the sacrifice of leadership here, of the people here, to judge themselves and their effectiveness, not by 20th century metrics, but by 21st, and to play for an audience of one. So, Father, continue to bless, grow, and bring vibrancy to this church, even as we come out of COVID again, to be the light and the influence you've destined them to be. In Jesus' name.